Fulton County EMS providers. We are now on section seven of the protocols that are being implemented on February 1st, 2024. For section seven, we have myself, John Toit, the EMS system manager, Bonnie Kincaid, the executive director, and Dr. Gedalia Cooper, our deputy medical director. So just a few things to note in section seven before we get to Dr. Cooper. The contaminated patient protocol is no longer located in Section 7. That's now been moved to Section 10. 7.9 airway management will not be covered in this session. It is being reviewed by the Oakland County Medical Control Protocols Committee. 7.16 patient restraint will not be covered in this session. Again, it is being reviewed by the Oakland County Medical Control Protocols Committee. And there are a couple discontinued protocols, the nasal intubation protocol and the impedance stress hold device protocol are no longer in place in Oakland County. So we have Bonnie and Dr. Cooper back with us for section seven. And we're going to start with 7.1, 12 lead EKG. 12 lead EKG. So really here, the main change in this protocol is that it gives you a number seven. It gives you the ability to repeat a 12 lead for either prolonged transports or if there's any changes in condition. So the next one, 7.2, child abuse and neglect. The state separated child abuse and adult abuse. So our protocol used to just be one protocol for all abuse and neglect, adult and child. And what the state did is the state took it and made it 7.2 and 7.4. So the state basically just took our previous single protocol and made it into two protocols. Just remember for child abuse, you got to do a 3200 form. And the number to call the Department of Health and Human Services hotline is at the bottom of the protocol. There's also the 3200 form and instructions on what each box is supposed to have. And then section 7.3, which is in between the two abuse and neglect protocols, just the crime scene management protocol. There's just an added reference uh, to the sexual assault treatment protocol that we've discussed previously, uh, 2.15. So really no big changes there. And the same thing here, here's 7.4. This is the vulnerable adult protocol. By all means, review this protocol but really no major changes from our previous protocol. And now we get into the first protocol in 7.5 where there are some changes too. Yeah, fair amount of changes to this one. 7.5 CPAP protocol. The state for right now no longer allows the use of BiPAP. At the OCMCA, we're currently working on an optional BiPAP protocol. We know some of you do use BiPAP. We use it in the emergency department. So we are working on a optional BiPAP protocol. There's some contraindications that are, that are here now that are kind of spelled out for adult and pediatrics. You want to be careful with the blood pressure. If the blood pressure is too low, you want to be careful using any kind of positive pressure because positive pressure will increase the pressure within the thoracic cavity and could potentially make the blood pressure even lower. Also under the procedure portion, it gives you a beginning value for titrating the CPAP pressure. It also allows you under number 10 to administer medications per appropriate protocol. You can briefly remove the CPAP for any oral or sublingual medication. Then we have a list of reasons that CPAP can and should be discontinued. If the patient can't tolerate the mask, if there's deterioration, if the patient has a decreased level of consciousness, patient is at risk for vomit, you can remove it because you don't, don't want him to aspirate on their vomit, or if it's determined to be clinically detrimental. And then under special notes for patients with decreased level of consciousness, just closely monitor. If you notice the decreasing level of consciousness is a reason to discontinue CPAP therapy. So you just want to be careful. If you notice your patients having a decreased level of consciousness, you want them to be awake enough to be able to remove that mask if they have to vomit, but also take note if they're becoming less responsive, you may need to start thinking about getting a more permanent airway on this patient. 
And then we get to the dead on scene termination of resuscitation protocol. One of the big parts about this protocol is the mortuary language. That all got moved into section eight. One thing that providers need to understand that cross county borders is that this protocol is very specific to Oakland County. Yep, and I'm gonna explain why we chose for this protocol what we chose. Dead on scene protocol, they added a purpose for it, which is pretty self-explanatory for the purpose. The submersion water temperature changes we already discussed in section two. There's also added a reference to my post, which we'll discuss in a little bit. They added a line about pregnant patient arrest if it's witnessed by either bystanders or EMS personnel, resuscitate the patient and immediately transport to the closest facility. I'm going to say about the pregnant patient, immediate transport and resuscitation is important because there's a second patient potentially, depending on how far along this patient is, there's a second patient potentially that could be saved the quicker the transport. This section here on for all other patients, just review it. It just talks about the fact that you're supposed to continue resuscitation on scene for at least 30 minutes. And then they added some information about when you can move the patient, when you can't, and when it should be transported and when it shouldn't. Termination of resuscitation, if ROSC is not achieved, after 30 minutes of ALS time, and I just want to say it's 30 minutes of ALS time, then you contact medical control for consideration of termination. The one thing I want to point out, contact medical control for termination if you have asystole in all three leads. A patient who's in PEA or any other rhythm needs to be transported. We've seen Time and time again, where a patient whose rhythm was PEA, and we actually had this happen recently, twice at Corwell Health Troy, where we had patients that were pronounced over the radio in PEA, they ultimately ended up getting ROSC and showing up in the ER. And this is likely because the patient probably had a rhythm and just not a palpable pulse. It's very, very difficult in the field without ultrasound, without other means of figuring out if this patient truly does not have any perfusion. So unless it's asystole, please just transport the patient. Those are some pretty big issues with Oakland County specifically. Again, asystole is all you can pronounce in Oakland County. Then we get to protocol 7.7, .7, do not resuscitate. Yep. And the change in this protocol really is just a reference to MI post which I think is a nice change because now you'll have potentially if a patient and physician sign this, you'll have exactly what this patient's wishes are and what the wishes are not, and that you can tailor care in the field to that and then also help us out in the hospitals with telling us what the patient's wishes are. Electrical therapy, 7.8. Just add some precautions to electrical therapy. I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Don't use electricity if the chest wall is wet or the patient is very, very sweaty. Don't do it over nitro paste or patches, over pacemakers. Don't have somebody being in contact with the patient while defibrillation. So those are all things that are mentioned I think are pretty self-explanatory. One other thing here also is don't apply it to patients with LVADs and keep your interruptions to a minimum. Also, the placement of the pads our anterior and posterior are the preferred placement, if possible. And then the protocol utilizes the word shock instead of defibrillation. There were just a couple added precautions that were specific to specific types of electrical patient care. So you'll want to take a look at that. Helmet removal. There are no changes to this protocol. So that's pretty easy. Oxygen administration, a very small change, just took the non-rebreather range flow of oxygen from 8 to 12 to 8 to 15, but no other changes. Protocol 7-13, pain management. Added to this protocol is now referencing the MyMedic cards for the pediatric patients younger than or equal to 14 years of age, but using the doses in the protocol as well. Important to note here is that ketamine is back but it is post-radio. Please review the dosing for pain. 
Ketamine is only to be used for pain and not for other indications. And again, it's only post-radio. If ketamine is given, again, post-radio, and there's still pain, then there is an option to give opioid medications, but that is also post-radio. If they didn't give ketamine as the initial medication, then the option is to give morphine or fentanyl. That can be done pre-radio. There's max dosing there, and that's all in the protocol. Protocol 7-14, uh, all that was added here was a reference at the end to the crashing patient protocol. Otherwise, it's the same. Protocol 17, uh, just note that uh, EPCR must be completed any time that EMS agency arrives on scene. Not dispatch, but arrives on scene. So this is a little bit of a change. The state has accepted the ability for agencies to document their canceled runs in other places. And Oakland County just migrated to say, yes, as long as you are documenting that someplace else, you only have to do your PCRs when you arrive on scene. And the next one, subsection of 715, 715-1, just important to point out, this is an Oakland County specific protocol. And the important thing to note here is that the requirement is to have the EPCR to the hospital. It's still two hours. If two hours to get it to the hospital. There's been no change to that. Just so that everybody notices that 7.16 is missing, that is currently under review by the Oakland County Medical Control Authority Protocols Committee. And then 7-17 is patient procedural sedation. The purpose was changed to just encompass procedures. There was a note added to remind providers that ketamine is not indicated in this protocol. We utilize midazolam and fentanyl. For 7.18 pleural decompression, we are going to take it back through our protocol process to see if we could make that technique under 2B, midclavicular, for adults as well as pediatrics. 7-19, refusal of care for adult and minor. The, the language has been changed to calling a patient capable as opposed to competent. Competency is a legal definition, not something we should be using in a medical setting necessarily. It also has put in a definition for minor, for what a minor is. Also, there is a reminder in there to the EMS provider that the inability to obtain a signature does not preclude completion of a documentation of a refusal. And there's also a requirement that there's documentation that supports your clinical judgment that the patient was capable to refuse transport or a specific treatment. And then we got all the documentation that goes along with it that we provide in the protocol. So you have your sample refusal form that we just went through. Then we have 7-20 spinal precautions. Really, the only thing that was added here is just a reminder that if you have a pregnant patient, just monitor the venous return of the pregnant patient. And if you need to, if the patient becomes hypotensive or just in general, just place the uterus to the left or position the patient appropriately. And there are still reasons to why you should be backboarding people. So absolutely review this protocol so that you have a complete understanding of when it's appropriate to backboard a patient. This protocol works in conjunction with the spinal assessment protocol from section two. So review those together so you know when you should be backboarding a patient. Section 7-21, a blood glucose level testing protocol. Just to review this real quick, it's a short protocol. It's pretty intuitive, but the indications are for altered mental status, or if it's indicated in the treatment protocol that you're following, there isn't really a contraindication. Oakland County MCA has approved it for medical first responders, for those that are appropriately trained and approved to do it. Protocol 7-22, tourniquet application. The only real changes here is there's a reference to the pain management protocol just pointing out that a successfully placed tourniquet may cause significant pain. And so therefore they reference the pain management protocol. And then there's mention made of the ability to place a second tourniquet adjacent to the first if bleeding is not fully controlled. Protocol 7-23, 
vascular access and IV fluid therapy. There's a list of indications for IO. They have taken out one of the indications that we had previously, which was status epilepticus. We're going to take this back to protocols. But for right now, the way the protocol reads is that these four things, cardiac arrest, severe burn injury with shock, shock, severe multi-system trauma with shock, those are the indications for IO. And any other reasons that you'd want to put an IO in, you need to call medical control, but do not delay transport. There's also a couple added contraindications, which I think are pretty self-explanatory. If you have burns overlying the available peripheral sites, unless there's no other site available, and infection overlying the peripheral sites. And under solutions, again, it's pretty self-explanatory, but you can use the fluid that you have, saline or lactated ringers. The one thing to note is that normal saline is the only fluid to be used if you're diluting or reconstituting a medication, unless it's otherwise specified in that protocol. And then it added some fluid bolus rates for pediatrics and for adults. And then it mentions that non-resuscitative fluid should be kept at KVO unless otherwise specified by protocol. In the cardiac arrest situation, the preferred site is the proximal humerus. In a perfect world, that is wonderful because it is closest to the heart where you want to get the medication. It's totally understood that in a cardiac arrest situation, there's likely somebody on the chest doing CPR, a lot of things happening around the head of the patient, and this may not be possible, but the preferred site is the proximal humerus. Section 7. Dash two four. This protocol talks about end tidal CO2 monitoring. And really, the whole gist of this protocol is in your sick patients, use this. And in some patients, you have to use it per protocol now. And this is a big change for EMS administrations. Understand there is going to be an expectation that you are going to be getting a quantitative number through the nasal cannula capnography on ill patients now. But there are some situations where qualitative measurements are acceptable. 7.25, my post. So just briefly, this is going to be paperwork that you may start seeing. And it's basically just a document stating what a patient's wishes are in different situations, if their heart were to stop, if they need certain medications life-saving medications. And if it's an appropriately filled out form and signed by the patient and by the physician, then please, by all means, two things. Number one, follow the patient's wishes. But number two, bring the form with you to the hospital, because that's very, very helpful for us in the hospital to know what the patient's wishes are. There's also a website that has more education on the topic. And that's michigan.gov backslash EMS. Go under the education tab and then education provided by the department. And there's two classes on Michigan My Post to assist you in understanding this new protocol. 7.26, interfacility high flow nasal cannula. This is our previous protocol, 8.19.1. There are some additions. They added that if it's available, then it can be indicated. There's also added age range information. And just to note, that certain patients with congenital heart conditions may have baseline oxygen saturations that are lower than 90%, and that is where they typically hang out. Their pulse ox is never greater than that number, and getting their pulse ox normal can be harmful for these patients. So just something to always keep in mind. Protocol 727 is a protocol about adult ventilator-dependent patients. It just gives some direction. And if you have a patient that's on a ventilator, how you're going to transport the patient. It provides providers that might not see it very often some direction. And this is a new protocol for Oakland County. Yeah, and it's, it's a framework, but I think one of the most important things here is always be ready to troubleshoot what's going on with the ventilator. One of the things mentioned in the protocol is always have your bag valve mask ready. You can always disconnect the ventilator and utilize your bag valve mask and suctioning if you run into trouble.
Protocol 728 talks about left ventricular assist devices. As you can see, the contact information has been left blank. That's because we want you to contact the medical control if you run across the patient that has an LVAD. Contact the medical control and ask the hospital to contact the LVAD coordinator closest to or in that area. This protocol is also going back to the protocol committee to simply say contact medical control, but for now, with in the absence of contact information, simply contact medical control should you come across one of these devices in the field. And then 7.29, the mechanical chest compression device protocol. This was an MCA optional protocol. We made slight alterations to the state version by clarifying that this is for all levels of providers, MFRs all the way up to paramedics. Notice there are examples there of when the mechanical compression devices could be used. We encourage you to document well on why you chose to use your mechanical compression device. And that's really it for section seven. That's one of the longer sections. We go into section eight next. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for coming for this section. We really appreciate it. It was a pleasure being here. Everyone should continue the great work that they're doing for our patients. Thank you all for joining us for section seven. We look forward to talking to you some more in section eight.